the sheep. Mmm, strawberries. They're in season now. They're not in season in January. In the capital debates, F.A. Hayek, John Robinson, Straffa, they made the point that market prices, market prices are relevant when making any type of valuation. My name is Mark Bernat. I'm a monetary economist. In this video, I want to talk about Russian debt, why it potentially is the largest in the whole wide world. And if we're the only world there is with intelligent life, the entire universe. The Tsar of Russia had made two ridiculous claims the other day that one, Ukraine and Russia are one. And I'm not even going to go there. It's so ridiculous. He wouldn't understand the Ukrainian language, culture, history, religion, or anything or identity, self-identity. But two, maybe as ridiculous to me, it hurts my ears when he says the Russian debt is perhaps the lowest in the world. He may have even made the claim it's the lowest in the world. Certainly is very low. I, I don't even know the statistics like 14% of debt to GDP. So I'm going to unpack this claim, decompose it. To flee, I'd like to see something else decompose. But when it talks about debt, you always have to put it in relation to income, debt to GDP. So somebody who has, for example, $5,000 of debt, but they're making a million dollars a year, that's low debt. I'll give them that. But if somebody has $5,000 of debt, and yet all they make is $12,000 a year, that's a financial burden. Now, if they make $2,000 a year or $1,000 a year, that's a huge financial burden. And that might be the situation of Russia right now. So when talking about debt in general, there's calculation errors and a few overstatements and a few understatements. An overstatement might be inflation because interest payments are in nominal terms. Another overstatement might be capital budgeting because it's treated as an expense when you create a government project such as you build a bridge, and it's not typically, or a school or something, it's not typically uh, depreciated and amortized over time. Where in capital budgeting, we know that in private industry, we do this. You're not looking at returns, and it's just expensed out. And also the business cycle. It has the potential to overstate and understate a debt. You know, there's some economists that want a uh, full employment, full debt, because during booms, you know, you have one statement based on revenue generation, and during bust, you have another statement because of lack of revenue and ability to tax, uh, collect taxes. But on the other side, on the negative, on the con side of the government debt, you have something called uncounted, undisclosed, off paper type liabilities. In a transparent democracy such as the United States, we know that to be. Medicare and Social Security as the primary drivers. But we also have liabilities that are not even able to be counted for, such as what if st student loans are not paid? You know, that's a potential bailout. So that's a gross understatement of the actual debt. And this examination is does Russia have anything like that? First thing you want to do is market prices. There's no market test for anything in Russia because it's a centrally planned economy and it does not have transparency. It's run by an autocratic, uh, you know, central Moscow bureau. And when you have something like that, you know everything is off budget. They have circular everything, the banks, state owned or quasi state owned, they have debt. And the debt is just transferred from the government balance sheet to the state-owned balance sheet. In the, and it's circular. They have it owned back. What about state-owned industries? The same thing. Gazprom, I don't even know that's still in business. The debt is transferred from the government to a private balance sheet, but it's still debt, which is an obligation of the government. Same thing with, unlike our states in the United States or regions, we have ability to raise taxes in each 
locality is individually responsible. In Russia, they have that, but not really. It's all rolled up under the government centrally planned idea. So that debt is grossly, grossly understated because that's a government debt. <clears throat> what about military expenditures? These are expenditures, and not only that, the personnel, they have obligations to these personnel, whether it be pension, health care, you know, once they have been evaporated or transcended or descended into the next realm, they have obligations to the family. These are not on the balance sheet when you're, they're calculating debt. So when they calculate that they're one of the lowest, that's most likely, or I would say with great confidence as a monetary economist, a propaganda claim. What is the true disclosure? What is the true value of the Russian debt? If you carve out the state-owned, this, you know, cooking the books, funny accounting, and these artificial type pension, you know, not really on the balance sheet, retirement, health care, and you bring it to transparency, bring the light and truth to the Russian debt to GDP ratio. What you have is you have an estimate of official sovereign debt about 17% of GDP. You have state-owned enterprises, SOEs, at 30 to 50%. You have regional and local debt at 15%. You have state-directed loans, bank liabilities at 20 to 30 percent. You have military-industrial complex classified 30 to 40 percent, and I think that's a huge understatement. I really think it should be more towards 60 percent. Pension and social security obligations, 60 to 80 percent. Health care uh, and social liabilities, 30 to 40 percent. When want to go to a hospital in Russia, I've been there. It's nothing to write home about. Contingent liabilities, and, and that's what I was talking about with student loans. It's bailouts, FX reserve drawdowns, 20 to 30 percent. Currency debasement ruled, uh, you know, trust and deficit. Ruble is just funny money, okay? It's artificial. It's not tested in the market. The bonds are not tested in the market because foreign governments and individuals are not picking up loans. They're not buying them. So what do we have? We have subtotal estimates on a conservative basis of two to 300% debt to GDP, more likely 300% of GDP on a realistic debt to GDP ratio. And if you, you know, are a little bit more aggressive, it's a 500% debt to GDP ratio. Japan, the highest in the world is like 260, let's say. U.S., depending on how you do it, is 130 you know, or something like that. So the debt-to-GDP ratio in Russia could potentially be 500%. If we're honest and we'd have market prices testing it and there's transparency. That would be like somebody makes 5000 and they, they're a pretty low income, $5,000 a year. No, what? Uh, they make $1,000 a year and they have $5,000 of debt. That doesn't sound like a healthy economy. If the final debt to GDP, because you've got to adjust it for, they claim a, a GDP of 2.2 trillion, they've got a realistic estimate of GDP, maybe 800 billion, but as low as seven to 600 billion for total GDP because everything's inflated. That brings you an effective debt to GDP of 500%. So basically, anything that the czar of Russia says is the opposite of truth. He doesn't take it a bit of smidgen of truth, mixing truth with lies, which he does. But when it comes to economics, it's the polar opposite. When you have a high debt to GDP ratio, the effect is it crowds out private investment. It's, there's the oppor high opportunity cost of creating a public good versus a private good. Now, if these public goods are bridges, if these public goods are, you know, something that adds value to the economy, they probably do so in a less efficient way. But if there's something that is called capital destruction, and I made that reference, Moscow's eating something, it's eating the future capital of future generations by incurring high debt. Then what you really have to think about is 
can Russia ever recover? And I talked about, again, intertemporal rates being the essence of interest in the last video. That's based on Bombavark and their capital, Austrian understanding of capital. How can we possibly understand what is going on behind the Russian economy unless we're honest and transparent? And we test it with something called market prices, right? Market prices. Strawberries are tested for market prices. They're low now, they're in season, and in January, they're high. Market prices, true valuations don't exist in Russia. But as an economist who focuses on statistics and numbers with great confidence, I can say it is a gross exaggeration to say that the debt to GDP is 17%. And in all probability, with a conservative estimate, you're talking 250, 300, and my aggressive estimate, over 500%. That crowds out private investment. And just think crowding out is like, you know, some speedy delivery company versus a post office. I worked for UPS. Everything was about efficiencies. They had industrial engineering, seeing how like, one move of the human body could take time off if aggregated across all people. And I'm not thinking the post office is doing that as efficiently. So the entire economy slows and grinds to a halt. They steal the future of the children. There is no future to, of Russia. Okay? Unfortunately. So if we want to make the world a better place, we've got to be honest. And the Russian economy is still going down. It's still collapsing. It's the end. It's the, probably the worst place to live on planet Earth. Maybe there's some worse places. I mean, my friend, you know, everybody says, well, what about Africa? My friend's from Kenya. He likes it. It's pretty nice. It's got, it's got a beautiful place. It's got a, a little, uh, you know, field in the back growing tea. Russia, high debt. And that's not even c considering that the consumer debt is going through the roof. So that's my video making the claim based on the Russian government transfers what would normally be official debt to their state-owned companies, and they have uncountable amount of undisclosed and uncounted liabilities. My name is Mark Birnot. I'm a monetary economist. Enjoy some strawberries while they're in season. Have a beautiful day. Thank you very much.